This is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes past the hour, final half hour of the Jeff Santos Show here on this uh, Friday edition of the program. We'll be uh, back next week with uh, hopefully uh, some uh, some local officials from Wisconsin and some other issues we're working on uh, across the country and uh, hopefully uh, uh, another discussion with uh, our good friend Melissa T- uh, Tomlinson who we're, we're going to have on today but we'll get her back in her normal slot on Tuesday at, uh, at 5 p.m. Our next guest uh, needs a little introduction. He's been a regular here on the Jeff Santos Show for some several years now, uh, formerly on Tuesdays, now on Fridays. Uh, he is uh, the renaissance man of the Jeff Santos Show. He's a great musician. You hear his music time to time here. We play a lot of his uh, a lot of his own music. And, of course, uh, he is uh, a great journalist at Democracy Watch News and a great advocate. Uh, we're going to talk strike. We're going to talk a lot of things with uh, Mark Taylor Canfield. And starting uh, right now, uh, MTC, great to have you back. Happy Friday, sir. Welcome, Jeff, to my world, the studio where the guitar feeds back when you were trying to listen to your friend on the phone. So sorry about that when you were doing your introduction. <laughs> oh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, eat your heart out. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, it's been a crazy week. Actually, I was trying to, I was pitching for a TED Talk. I want to do a TED Talk, and I also pitched as a performer. So we'll see what happens. It's quite an elaborate. Yeah, um, get out your get process. out your acoustic guitar, get a chair, and they'll they'll you know you'll be. Uh, You'll be welcomed by the TED Talk folks. You know, you can consider yourself the uh, the uh, Seattle philosopher from the 206. Oh, um, my gosh. Well, you know, I saw Reggie Watts do a TED Talk. You know, and he's our guy from Seattle, you know, and the late night band leader on the talk shows. But, yes, oh, my yes, God. Yes. He did an incredible TED Talk that I'll never forget. It was mind-blowing. I don't know whether he was on drugs or what he was doing, but it was a totally surrealistic presentation where he impersonated about five different people and you know changed the theme of the talk about four times and then did some improvisation on his with his beatbox and his uh loop pedals and it was crazy uh reggie watts is somebody we never talk about but he is a local jewel here and i remember seeing him play with his his band here locally in seattle before he moved to la um but yeah, he's he's a big icon here, and he kind of inspired me to try it myself. And the TEDx Seattle folks do have performers, so they are looking for musicians and artists to perform, um, and then also people to give talks. So I I applied for both to see what they do. You know? <laughs> I don't think that disqualifies me, but I doubt they're going to let me do both. You know, so there well, you, go. you know, one one uh, one one or two of you know can 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 kind of make it work. Uh, Mark, you know, we uh, we're talking there here with um, our good friend Joe Sandberg and others about a general strike. And uh, before we get into what uh, I know, you were in a, a mayor, uh, a person running for mayor in Seattle, and about you know what it would do. But a lot of people who voted for Bernie in 16, uh, were, were huge. You know, I remember that, that event at, uh, at Mariner Stadium. We'll get into the Mariners and the great comeback win on opening day as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know, 30,000 people, whatever it was, at the ballpark to see Bernie Sanders. I'm thinking that if, if you're going to do, you know, a strike in this country, whether it's at the Capitol or around different cities around the country, Seattle's going to have to be a big part of it. And I'm wondering, as, you know, the, the protest of the Floyd protest that really ousted your police commissioner, uh, is it uh, a scenario where the mayor is not going to run uh, this time, or is she going to just face uh, a bunch of folks, uh, you know, like... Um, like Miss uh, Colleen uh, Echo Hawk uh, in there, and I'm wondering if you know if if you know Seattle can be one of those cities that lead you know changes and and have masses of demonstrations peacefully, of course, uh, that look to change America, uh, much as the the March on Washington did in the early 1960s, that uh, pushed uh, the Kennedy administration towards civil rights before he was tragically assassinated, and eventually in '64, uh, you know, saw that legislation come into play um give me your your thoughts on that because i i'm i'm fascinated by seattle politics and how progressive it is well that's a long you know this could be a really 
long segment for some future date, too, because we were actually discussing some of the stuff yesterday at the Democracy Watch News press briefing, and we had some good guests on talking about food redistribution programs, too, which was really important that, that that's going on across the country. But one of the themes was uh, how they asked me, you know, how did the, the – coalition happen, the progressive coalition happened after the World Trade Organization demonstration in Seattle, where you had Greenpeace uh, environmentalists marching with steel workers and actually showing up to support the steel workers during their strike in Tacoma, uh, so at the Kaiser plant. So, you know, um, we have a history of trying to build these kinds of movements and that was part of an effort, actually, to create something called the N30 Coalition, which was a coalition of labor, environmental, and political groups, and civil rights groups, and church groups, all the people who had marched against the World Trade Organization in Seattle during the Ministerial Conference in 1999, decided to try to create a regional coalition. And it was also tried in Boston, by the way, and other folks around the country were trying this own kind of, their own kind of regional organization because uh, people were in touch with each other. Um, and consulting with each other. In Seattle, it came down to a series of meetings, and there was talk about the ability of the longshoremen especially to shut down the ports on the west coast of the United States. And they have done that in the past uh, during a, an Iraq war protest that happened. And so it was very well known that if you can get the Teamsters and the ILU uh, ILWU and uh, the Longshoremen and the uh, and the uh, other folks together into some kind of a coalition that you have amazing amounts of power. And one example of that, Jeff, was there was a ship that came into the port of Seattle called the Wan He, and it was a cargo ship, and it was rumored to contain some PCBs and uh, apparently from an ex U.S. or from a U.S. military base. But Greenpeace alerted the folks in Seattle that the ship was on the way and that it had toxic waste on it and that they were looking for a place to illegally dump it. And what happened is, is that a lot of the environmentalists showed up down at the port at Harbor Island and were able to coordinate with the longshoremen and the Teamsters to make sure that that uh, toxic waste was not unloaded in Seattle. And eventually, after several you know, major protests down at the port and some some work slowdowns, you know, by the, the union guys to try to help the situation. Uh, they had to follow their contracts. They couldn't strike, but they definitely, you know, a lot of trucks didn't seem to work that day, and the trains weren't working. The cranes weren't working very well. Um, and they worked together with the environmentalists to make sure that this issue got out. And eventually, Jim McDermott um, got a hold of the topic and ordered that ship out of Seattle. So there's an example of how these coalitions can actually be effective politically. Now, the problem is, is that during, and this is, you know, goes back to the 1919 general strike in Seattle. Seattle was the first major city in the United States to have a general strike. A lot of it was organized by uh, the laundry workers and uh, the working class folks in the city. Um, but the problem with the N30 coalition was that a lot of the groups uh, started their infighting. And, you know, it's been said before that, you know, the left eats its own or whatever, but there were definitely some problems. Number one, People couldn't decide how to decide because there was a tradition which continued through the Occupy movement of consensus decision making, where we're all trying to you know build consensus and get on board. But the union uh, guys and girls they were used to one woman, one man, one vote, so they wanted nothing to do with consensus decision making. They wanted to just pack the vote because that's how you know they work. There were also some other uh, more radical leftist groups who um, did the same thing, who showed up with a bunch of people and tried to monopolize the vote and the discussion. And so eventually it started to fall apart. And these meetings that started with like 500 people showing up ended up with 50, you know what I mean? So there's an example of how it's been, how we've tried it in the past and some of the inherent you know, weaknesses in those kinds of movements. Somehow that has to be overcome and people have to be able to work together on issue-oriented uh, movements where maybe we don't agree on everything, but we can agree on this one thing. And for instance, you know, that toxic waste shouldn't be dumped into the harbor in Seattle. So right. there's a possibility that that kind of um, uh, networking and coalition building could happen again, Jeff. I mean, now that people are getting a little bit more uh, ready to, to gather in public, you know, we just had opening day for the Mariners and a couple of my friends' bands already played shows, but Black Tones played in a huge airplane hangar, 
down a bowling field. So there was lots of space for social distancing. Um, and then ministry and frontline assembly, the godfathers of the whole industrial music movement, uh, performed at the Showbox Theater with limited capacity, of course. But, you know, people are starting to come back. We've had uh, 70,000, uh, 130,000 people marched on women's, um, during the International Women's Day march here. Well, see, that uh, to me, uh, that, that's, a, that's a really good sign. And I want to take a call from John, who's uh, one of our great callers. And, uh, you know, you've talked to him in the past, uh, second here, uh, who's also been advocating for a strike along with the great Sarah Nelson. I just think that Seattle, with its progressive politics, much like uh, your rival city in both football and, and, uh, and in the West Coast world, uh, San Francisco, you know, is, is sort of the leader, uh, if you might. You know, and I, and I, I good and I, great friends at ninety two uh, seven FM in Madison will will take umbrage too as another progressive city. But, but you know, I really think that Seattle is uh, some place where you really can lead. Uh, you know, a across the country perspective. And again, you have uh, been the leader on the minimum wage. You've been the leader on uh, on uh, legalizing marijuana. I mean, there's a lot of history there. And as you uh, recounted, you know, going back a long way in terms of uh, you know stopping the environmental degradation. You know, going back to 2000. So, and it goes back before that too. Uh, but let's let's take a call from from John in uh, in Minneapolis. So I know he has a couple of things to say, Mark and. Um, I, I, I believe that, you know, that may be one of the avenues that we have to use if we are going to uh, push Joe Biden and push a more progressive America, um, you know, on the leaders in Washington and around the country. Uh, I, I go ahead, John. You're next with Mark Taylor Canfield. Yeah, uh, maybe you could do your show from the Washington, you know, from the Capitol steps. And Mark Taylor Canfield and some other artists can be there. Yeah, All right, well, I would love to do that. On, you know, and, and I think it would be great. You know, the power of music, uh, even one song, can really uh, change and focus the attention uh, onto something so profound uh, and, and, you know, break through to the entire population. Like, I, I'll give you an example, because uh, you're an artist and you're a songwriter, I think Buffy St. Marie's song, Universal Soldier, uh, did so much to bring attention uh, to the anti-war uh, movement and for, you know, what, what goes on, you know, in modern uh, economies and in modern warfare and, and what it results in and just the death and, and, uh, and desperation that it produces. And I think she was crucified by uh, J. Edgar Hoover, that nasty man. Uh, but, you know, she, she broke through it. She r- rallied, uh, and uh, it was on Sesame Street. And then uh, I think she now lives in, in Hawaii, and I think she's quite a uh, happy person from what I, I hear. Uh, but who uh, uh, knows where J. Edgar is, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure who you're referring to because you, you cut oh, out there. Uh, yeah, I can address this. Uh, yes, actually, I've met her. Buffy St. Marie was a famous yeah. singer, songwriter, folk singer from the 1960s, who was sort yep. of. She told me, okay, so it's great that she brought her up because I was able to interview her, and it's been one of the uh-huh. seminal interviews in my life. Was meeting her oh, great. and being yeah. around such a graceful, uh, peaceful, uh-huh. wonderful person. Um, yep, the older older woman now, still incredibly beautiful. Amazing yep. person, and uh, uh-huh. I had to interview her in Canada because there was this uh, movement about it, there was a an, an effort to celebrate the draft the Vietnam War resistors who had went who had fled to Canada during the Vietnam War, and she was one of the artists that was there. It was also Country Joe from Country Joe and the Fish was there. Oh yeah, so I got sure. to interview him and see him perform. Punk band DOA, George McGovern was there. Arun, this is just before he passed away. Arun Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's grandson was there. Some incredible people that I got to talk to. Tom Hayden, you know, amazing people from the 60s uh, movement that really inspired me. And Buffy St. Marie was, was one of my favorite interviews of all time. It was just such a, such a wonderful woman. And she told me that uh, she felt like when she was first approached by the music industry and the record labels that basically they were looking for 
a Native American Joni Mitchell. That's what she told me. <laughs> and she was more than willing to play that role. Um, her song, Universal Soldier, which you just mentioned, uh, I have covered, and I know that song well. And it is a very powerful yeah. song yeah. Um, about soldiers of all yeah. different types of countries, you know, and what their experience yeah. is being thrown into battle. So thank well, you. Well, if you think about the 60s protest through. songs yeah. as a whole, yeah. uh, Mark and John, I mean, you think of, of Joan Baez and you think of Patti Smith and you think of, uh, you know, oh, Simon yeah. and Garfunkel. You can go on and on. Awesome. Buffalo Springfield. I mean, you know, there there are so many. I mean, we, we play for, for her Boyd, uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, and what's going on here. So, I mean, you know, it, it is... It is those songs that you know are classics yeah. today that are, are that are critical, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know you have said this, and I know Mark you know li- lives by that mantra in his daily life because uh, you can make yeah. a difference, uh, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thanks, you know, John. I, you know, I I think that one of the again the the elements here. Uh, and again, I don't know if anybody has talked about a strike in those words in, in Seattle, if, if Jayapal and Ms. Sawant, uh, or if the interview you uh, did with uh, a conference call with, uh, with Colleen uh, uh, as well, who's running for mayor. Uh, and I, I just think that, you know, we're at a point now where the political infrastructure needs uh, to be shaken up in a nonviolent way. You know, obviously today, once again, uh, violence has hit the capital of the United States. You may be aware of the fact, Mark, uh, one officer dead, the person who, who had tried to initiate the attack is now also dead. Uh, you know, the violence, which we've seen perpetrated uh, on videotape this week on the, on, the, on the Chauvin trial on Mr. Floyd, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard really hard to sort of watch and it's it's hard to not think that those those uh protests peaceful protests for the most part uh this past summer you know has had an impact on on how the trial uh was put together uh you know the the emotions to be brought out of all the witnesses i think keith ellison is doing a great job uh, you know mr frank who's his top attorney the assistant attorney general of minnesota i think those all those uh, you know lead up to the idea that if people get active you can make a a, a big difference and i think you've seen that in seattle right yeah i mean we have definitely an activist history here much like you know berkeley or san francisco um and by the way, the Mariners beat the Giants. Ha ha ha! Came back from five runs yes, down. Yes, yes, indeed. For an opening, that was a great. Uh, that was a great impressive. comeback. And you did it without Mister Lewis, your best player, too, right? Yeah. So that that's historic for Seattle. But uh, on a more serious note, as they would say, I, I think you know Seattle does have an activist history. A lot of that did come from San Francisco, and a lot of people moved up here. Um, and so it is a tradition here. Um, and I'm glad to see, and we've also been discussing this at Democracy Watch News, I was glad to see much more youth-oriented uh, organizing uh, over this last year or two with the Black Lives Matter movement especially, where, you know, and the, the Trump protests, the protests against Trump, a lot of them were organized by high school kids here. So we're talking young folks. The one thing I don't, you know, miss about the 60s was the violence. So I'm hoping right. that we don't see that again. Yes, we don't need that. We don't need that. We have but seen, we have seen the violence of what that has caused over the last uh, uh, last two months ago or whatever it was in January or two, three months ago. And, uh, and of course, um, you know, what, what we had witnessed today and, and, of course, the violence that we have seen perpetrated on, on people of color, you know, by police in, in, in major cities and in small cities as well. And that is one of the things that I brought up with Colleen Echo Hawk. Now, she is a member of a band of the Tani Nation. She's a Native American woman, and she's running for mayor in Seattle. Uh, to answer your earlier question, Mayor Jenny Durkin, a former U.S. attorney in the Obama administration, has decided not to run again. Um, Good. And that is, I'm sure, a political decision. She's not very popular. There was a lot of pushback against her by the Black Lives, Lives Matter movement because of her use of the police department and then the excessive use of force and violence against protesters and, of course, people of color in this city as well. And, you know, dozens of black men have been killed by police here uh, with no prosecutions of police officers. Um, so this is 
a, a long history of these issues. So I brought that up with Colleen Echohawk, and she spent, I think, the, the largest, the longest uh, response to any question during the conference call was her response to my question. And I did go all the way back to the World Trade Organization protests, talking about police riots and police misconduct in Seattle and mass violations of people's civil rights. And, you know, she thanked me because she actually did not have that information, and a lot of folks in government don't. Um, a lot of folks haven't done the research. I had a group called the Committee for Local Government Accountability with some other really good civil rights activists in town, and we did a lot of research, came up with a report, um, gave that to the city and also to the Center for Constitutional Rights, and it, it outlines a lot of the police misconduct. They were doing the same kinds of things back then, like hiding their badge numbers, putting black tape over their badge numbers and hiding their name tags so people couldn't hold them accountable for their actions. And we and we experienced that over the last year with the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Um, what Colleen Echohawk had to say was that she takes uh, some of this personally because of the death of John P. Williams. He was a Native American woodcarver in Seattle who was killed by a police officer. Um, John T. Williams was well known in the city, very peaceful man. He was a woodcarver, which is a big tradition here, and you'll still, even at some of the, at the chop zone on Capitol Hill, there was a Native American man who brought his carvings, and he was carving beautiful, beautiful Native American art, and so it's a tradition. Uh, but this man was killed by a police officer because John T. Williams also had a hearing deficit and didn't hear the officer tell him to drop his knife, and the guy was killed, okay? So Colleen Echohawk talked about that incident and how it really opened her eyes to what was happening to people all over the country, and that that was uh, a sort of uh, consciousness-raising moment in her life. And ever since then, she's been very dedicated to trying to stop this violence by police department, departments, especially in Seattle. So I think she's very dedicated to taking on that issue. I don't think she's going to be very popular with the Seattle Police Officers Guild, which, by the way, was kicked out of the Martin Luther King Jr. County uh, Labor Council uh, because they're not really a union. They're more of a you know professional organization. But uh, she criticized the Seattle Police Officers Guild, said they were out of control. Um, we know that the, uh, Mike Sloan, the president of the Police Officers Guild in Seattle, has made some very, very uh, controversial statements, of, you know, and against the Black Lives Matter movement. So you have... Uh, a, a potential new mayor who will take this issue on directly, I think, in a way that maybe Mayor Durkin didn't feel comfortable doing. At the same time, I really want to compliment Colleen Echohawk and her family. She she was introduced by her her sister, by the way, so she had a lot of family support. But um, she is held or is in the process of holding twelve different town hall meetings around Seattle in each neighborhood, addressing each neighborhood directly. And on some of these uh, some of these events online, you know, I mean, she's talking directly to maybe only 15 people or something, but it doesn't matter to her. She really wants to grow her movement um, for this campaign for mayor from the grassroots up. I don't think she's relying on big-name Democratic donors, Democratic Party donors. I think she really wants this. Of course, they're publicly funded elections in Seattle. Yeah. We have our democracy vouchers that the city sends us. But I'm impressed, Jeff. I think she's... She's got really strong, of course, civil rights and well, progressive credentials, and she's doing a really good job of getting out in the community, and she's ahead of everyone else. The president that's great. of the council... Well, I'm going to look for her, because that's uh, that's uh, that's an important position. Again, uh, if we want Seattle to move, you're going to want to have a movement leader as the mayor, not another uh, corporate Democrat, as Absolutely. you had in Durkin, and, uh, and so right. forth. And I see that your former police commissioner is a contributor to MSNBC. Uh, I mean, I don't believe it, but that's, uh, that's, that's where we are today, and sometimes corporate TV. Uh, before we let you go, uh, kudos to your Mariners. Uh, you know, we want baseball to be strong in Seattle. Of course, they're, they're playing uh they're playing uh, great baseball uh and again doing it without their star player lewis so kudos to them my friend uh hey thanks mark we'll talk to you next friday keep on rocking jeff check me out at youtube everybody have a great weekend thank you we will thank you uh as always for coming on the program i want to thank the rest of our guests as well harvey k joe sandberg uh, and, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Joe Williams and uh, our good friend Patrick Claiborne. Keep on fighting, folks. Have a great weekend. My name is Jeff Santos. It's my time to say I got to go.